Hello and welcome back to Instrumentation and Control, where we teach you all about the principles of being an instrument technician. In the previous lessons, we looked at what are transmitters and the role they play in industry. In this video, we're going to talk about one of the main tools you will use when performing tasks on transmitters and any other instrumentation, and that is the loop diagram. Please remember to like the video and comment below if you're enjoying these videos or finding them useful. As an instrument technician, you'll routinely be maintaining, calibrating, repairing and replacing electronic instrumentation. In order to carry out most of these tasks, you'll need to have information on how that instrumentation is connected to the control side of the circuit or PLC, for example. Now this is where the loop diagram comes in. We'll work through an example of a loop diagram and point out all the important information these extremely useful documents have. Let's start with a simple pressure transmitter loop diagram as an example so we can go over the key components to the loop diagram. Here we have the loop diagram for pressure transmitter with a tag number PT123. Now a tag number is the unique number that identifies the equipment that is in situ on your specific site. The tag number will be referenced throughout your site's documentation including any maintenance instructions piping diagrams and loop diagrams. As we can see, the loop diagram shows all the electrical connections for PT123 from the field side on the left to the PLC side on the right. It's usual for loop diagrams to contain key data at the bottom of the document. We can see this in our specific example here at the bottom and we can find all the data relating to the document. All loop drawings will have a drawing number that is unique to this document. Now this is a key piece of information as it can be used to find drawing on your site's document management system. You often see drawings have a revision or issue number. Drawings that have been previously printed may not be the latest revision if you find them in the bottom of an electrical panel for example. If you have a drawing and are in any doubt of its validity Speak to your supervisor or check yourself on the drawing document management system if you have access to compare the version that you have with the version that's on the system to ensure you have the latest up-to-date information. Drawing numbers can also be a good way to include information in handovers or emails to colleagues as a quick reference. Looking at the title, the title is usually a reference to information of the equipment on the loop drawing. This might contain the equipment tag number or a description of the equipment's duty. Looking at the revision section of the drawing, most loop drawings give a history showing when any modifications have been made. It can also show who has drawn and who has checked the drawing. Although this information isn't as useful for day-to-day -day instrument technician work, it could come in handy if these drawings were modified by staff within your site or business and you need further clarification, you can then seek to get in contact with these people directly. Okay, onto the actual loop diagram itself. Let's point out all the information we can see on our drawing. Firstly, if we look down the center of the loop diagram, you can see a vertical broken line. This is used to separate the different physical areas the equipment goes through on your site. If we look at the top titles of the area this line is separating, we can see our transmitter has connections between the field side of the device and the local equipment room or LER. This is really important when locating elements within the loop diagram such as junction boxes or cabinets because it gives you that initial starting point to locate from. Okay, next let's look at the field device over on the left hand side of the drawing. In this case, our transmitter PT123. From our loop diagram, we can see that this is a two wire device and likely a 4 to 20 milliamp device. Although we can't be certain from this drawing, this could also be a voltage input, but as it's a two wire device, most modern devices going into analog inputs are 4 to 20. We can see it is connected via a one pair cable, which is P4785, the cause of which are black and white. We can also see there is a note labelled as note one. 
Looking down at the notes key in the bottom left, we can see it states that the screen of the cable is tied back and insulated. Now this is done to prevent ground loops, but that's something we'll talk about in a future video. We can see the cable connects to junction box JB57846 that is located in the field. Here, the cable terminates to terminals 004 and 005, and the screen to terminal 006 within the junction box. This is the sort of information that is required for calibration and any testing you might have to do on the equipment. It gives you the exact terminals where you're going to be putting your test equipment. So it's important to understand how that's working. If we look closely, we can see that this is pair two on the two pair cable. This is denoted by the small two next to the terminal connections. We can also see that these cores are colored red and blue. It's important to note that this two pair cable spans across the dividing area we spoke about before in the dotted line, showing that the signal is going from the local equipment room and into PLC cabinet four. Within the PLC cabinet, we can see the connections go into barrier five. Now the barrier is a device that is used to allow equipment to be powered in hazardous area or areas where explosive atmospheres are present. The barrier allows the equipment to be powered without creating a spark that would have enough energy to ignite an explosive atmosphere, thus providing the protection from explosion. We'll talk more about barriers and hazardous area equipment in future videos. We can also see this barrier is externally powered via a 24 volt DC power rail. Some barriers are powered by the PLC directly, but this one has a separate 24 volt DC supply. From the barrier, we can see that there is some internal patch wiring that is connected to a pre-wired breakout connector listed as TML SKT on terminals nine and 10. This type of equipment is often used to provide a neat and manageable cable interface between field connections and PLC inputs. Moving on to PLC cabinet five, we can see the final connection point. We can see that this is connected to node one, card five, channel two. Now, this information is more to do with the PLC infrastructure and allows us to locate the actual individual card where our signal from our pressure transmitter is connected into. It's also worth noting to the right of this information, we have the symbol of a square with a circle within it and a line through. This denotes the PLC's internal connection from a software point of view to the DCS or SCADA and shows that there is a high, high alarm and a low, low alarm. These are the conditions that will be shown to the operator and may have automated executive actions, such as shutting certain parts of equipment off or putting the plant into a safe condition. Okay, so hopefully if you see a loop diagram, you'll have a little bit more understanding of how to read one and some of the useful features you typically might find on the loop diagram. Thank you for listening and remember to like the video, subscribe and hit the bell icon for future content.